Good morning. My name is Tracy Wright, and I'm a physician in the Division of Pediatric Ornithology at UT Southwestern. I'm grateful for the LFA's invitation to come and speak with you today about pediatric lupus. Our objectives are to discuss the unique challenges in diagnosing and managing pediatric lupus and describe real world strategies that help improve patient outcomes. The vast majority of pediatric patients have systemic lupus, and it is much less common to have disease limited to the skin. Overall, there are many similarities with lupus occurring in adults as it relates to both demographics and clinical manifestations. I will highlight some of the unique features. Similar to adults, there is a female predominance and a disproportionate impact on patients of certain racial and ethnic minorities. In my clinic, patients with lupus may present between six and 18 years of age, but most commonly patients present after the onset of puberty. The overarching theme is to remember that children and adolescents experience very severe disease, and this can occur in several ways. Most commonly, pediatric patients have major organ involvement, especially kidney disease. They are also more likely to develop damage to their organs. In addition, the estimated mortality rate in adolescents and young adults is much higher in comparison to the overall estimate in all patients affected by lupus. Potential causes of mortality in this patient population include severe renal disease, severe disease flares, and infections. Finally, a very important aspect of diagnosing lupus in children relates to the fact that the diagnosis comes during a very challenging phase of life. The chronicity of the illness and the accumulative burden of disease manifestations and medication effects all contribute to the severe disease that children experience. Oftentimes, presenting features of lupus may be subtle at onset, and this may cause a significant delay in referral to the pediatric rheumatologist from the pediatrician. Because this diagnosis is less common in children, there's an urgent need to increase awareness and knowledge base about lupus for primary care pediatricians. In addition, there is a wide variation and how children and adolescents present. So this may further delay referral, but then also will require a comprehensive approach in evaluation and management. And finally, an additional factor that makes the diagnosis very challenging is the significant shortage of pediatric rheumatology clinicians. This map is taken from a study of the pediatric rheumatology workforce. It shows the distribution of pediatric rheumatologists throughout the United States. The study described the South Central region of the US, which is shown in gray, which includes Texas, as a region of particular concern. In 2015, there was an estimate of 0.2 pediatric rheumatology providers per 100,000 children. In 2030, they project only 0.2 zero four pediatric rheumatology providers per 100,000 children. Currently in Texas, besides our group who provides care at both Scottish Rite Hospital for Children and Children's Health, there is a group of pediatric rheumatologists in Fort Worth, in Austin, in Houston, and in the southern part of the state near Corpus Christi. However, there are no pediatric rheumatologists serving the eastern or western portions of the state. We have patients that may drive eight or more hours to come to our office for care. We also see patients from surrounding states, including Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana. And there remain some states in the US that still have no pediatric rheumatology providers. We will now shift our discussion to consider differences in clinical manifestations. There have been multiple research studies comparing differences in lupus manifestations for those who develop disease in childhood compared to those who develop disease in adults. This particular study describes features that were more common in children, including oral ulcers and decreases in cell counts, which included anemia and low platelets. In addition, several of the blood markers that we measure, 
including autoantibodies, such as the double-stranded DNA antibody, and low complements are seen more frequently in children. Furthermore, they found that children were more likely to have neuropsychiatric disease. And this exemplifies our earlier statement that children frequently have major organ involvement at the time of diagnosis. In contrast, the adults of this study were more likely to have arthritis and manifestations of serositis, which includes uh, fluid accumulation around the heart and fluid accumulation in the lungs, amongst other things. The most common organ manifestation that we see in children is renal disease. And this bar graph reflects um, the different distribution of renal disease between these groups. On the left, the two darker bars shown here reflect patients diagnosed during childhood and adolescence. On the right, the childhood and adolescent groups are combined. The key finding from this graph is the significant increase in the proportion of patients with lupus nephritis in the childhood onset group compared to adults. They also calculated the number of months of disease duration at the time of renal biopsy and found that the childhood onset group had disease for only approximately two months prior to their first renal biopsy. And this was in contrast to disease duration of approximately 24 months prior to renal biopsy for adults. And this finding is indeed consistent with what we see in our practice. Um, we argue the majority of our patients, at least 85% or, or more, have renal disease. They frequently have severe renal disease when we first meet them, and this often requires hospitalization for ongoing management and treatment. So thus far, we've discussed how the diagnosis may be challenging to make in children and how they manifest severe disease, including major organ involvement, such as the kidneys. Next, we will review some general principles of management before focusing on specific areas of concerns and strategies that may help improve outcomes. This table describes the different aspects of management that should be considered to provide comprehensive care for these patients. Medical management refers to their interaction with the physician or the nurse practitioner for clinic visits and hospitalizations. But it's also critically important to remember that children exist within a larger context of their family and their community. Family engagement and support is critical to these patients' success. There may also be additional partners, um, such as extended family members or partners through the school, such as a school nurse, that really help to contribute to patient care. Psychosocial management is also critically important and unfortunately sometimes overlooked. There's really an urgent need for increased access to mental health services. Some patients may benefit from interventions from physical and occupational therapy, especially when they have disease affecting their muscles and joints. Pediatric patients should still continue to receive ongoing well child care to address important issues of growth and development, nutrition, and immunizations. And as we have all been significantly impacted by the pandemic, continuity of care is even more important. Our team has become quite skilled in incorporating virtual visits into our practice. And this allows patients to have fewer trips to the clinic for non-urgent matters. And finally, we acknowledge the need for ongoing outreach with events such as this one to help ensure that patients, their families, and the larger community are well-educated about the diagnosis of lupus. So in pediatrics, appropriate growth and development is a critical measure of how we determine if a child is thriving. And unfortunately, both lupus and its treatments can have significant impact on a patient's growth and development. Patients may experience a delay in puberty, especially when the disease is very active. They may present with weight loss when they are ill with active disease. But in addition, patients may experience significant weight gain and loss of height from chronic steroid use. So this figure is an example of a growth chart. Whenever a pediatrician um, sees a patient, their height and weight are always recorded and then plotted on a graph such as this. And the gray curve lines show the range of expected trajectory of increase in height and weight over time according to age as the child grows. The top set of lines relate to the patient's height. 
outlined in red, you can appreciate how the patient had a flattening, then a decline in height during the period that they took steroids. In addition, the lower set of lines relates to the patient's weight and shows a significant increase in weight gain while on steroids. Once the patient was no longer taking prednisone, the height returned to normal levels and the weight gain began to decline. Because such a large proportion of our patients are teenagers, it is also important to understand their unique phases of development. As you may recall, there is rapid physical, psychological, and social developmental changes occurring all at once during the adolescent period. This table lists some of the primary challenges that adolescents are dealing with during this phase. And these include changes in biology, ability to form relationship with peers, and their quest to be more independent and autonomous. All of these rapid changes can make communicating with and managing adolescents with lupus very challenging. And furthermore, the impact of the disease and its therapies on body image is even more worrisome to them because of their phase of development. So this figure is taken from a focus group study of youth with lupus and mixed connective tissue disease, which is a disease that's related to lupus. And the purpose of the focus group study was to understand the psychosocial and physical impact of the disease on these patients. They found five overarching themes that were associated with a positive or negative illness identity. These included the impact on disease management, limitations experienced by the patient, stigma, uncertainty about the illness, and inability to cope psychologically. Patient characteristics, including psychosocial issues, all influenced how these patients experienced their illness. And this experience, in turn, influenced disease outcomes. Specifically, patients who had a more negative identity experience had worse disease damage, more pain, physical dysfunction, and depression and suicidal ideation. So this study really underscores the importance of a full psychosocial assessment as an essential component to provide comprehensive care. And indeed, we know that both depression and anxiety are very common. And there are estimates that approximately 20% of children with lupus have experienced suicidal ideations at some point. And a very large percentage, approximately 60%, have experienced depression. There are multiple psychosocial issues that contribute to their mental health, some of which we've mentioned, such as self-esteem, body image, peer relationships, and the need for acceptance. We've also previously mentioned how family support is critical. So therefore, family interactions, whether both positive or negative, will all play a role in what patients experience. The following images are some examples of common cutaneous manifestations of lupus. And these include a discoid lupus that in a patient of color will show up as dark lesions. And you can see here um, on the face, um, along the ears and on the scalp. When these lesions are present on the scalp, they are resulting um, in chronic hair loss that does not grow back. And as the active lesions heal, patients are frequently left with pigment changes or even scarring. These photos show some of the severe photosensitive rash with both blisters and some crusting that involve the face, lips, trunk, and other parts of the body. The other photo in the center shows alopecia, and this can result from both active disease as well as from therapy. So just imagine how might a child or teenager cope with these manifestations, especially those that are not going to fully resolve. Such manifestations will have an impact on both self-esteem and body image. And this again is very difficult to deal with when you are a teenager already going through rapid phases of development and looking for acceptance. The high prevalence of both depression and suicidal ideations really underscore the importance of mental health screening and access to mental health resources for this population. And my team is fortunate that we do have a psychologist at one of our clinical sites that helps facilitate screening. But we're also in the process of not only screening patients at every visit, but exploring opportunities for more in-depth assessments and management. 
Another important area of attention for pediatric patients is education. So school participation and performance for children is really comparable to the work experience um, for, as for adults. And certainly educational issues have important implications for peer interactions during the day, but also have future implications for gainful employment um, into adulthood. So we do encourage regular attendance to school, but sometimes school may still be missed due to many factors, including a disease flare, um, dealing with other illnesses such as infection, or unfortunately, sometimes even from negative peer interactions. Therefore, to help our patients remain in school and to succeed as students, we need to form an alliance with the school nurse, with the counselor and the teachers. And we also need to be aware of important interventions in the school setting that can help. And these include a 504 plan and an individualized education plan. So the 504 plan provides accommodations and modifications for any student with a medical condition. A 504 plan can also be instituted in the college setting. So some of the common accommodations that we include in our letters are the need for sun protection, and that needs to be consistently applied um, with sunscreen throughout the day. Um, we also encourage patients to have the opportunity to sit away from the window and out of direct sunlight. We do want patients to be physically active, but we recommend that they be allowed to participate in activities as tolerated and allowed to take rest breaks when they need to without any penalty. And finally, some patients, depending on their illness involvement, um, may even benefit from modifications uh, to their school schedule, such as a shortened day. So the Individualized Education Plan, or IEP, is separate but related. And this plan is a statement of academic and functional goals, as well as related services that might be needed to accomplish these goals. An IEP is part of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and therefore does have federal support to provide any service a patient needs to address academic issues. The IEP should be reviewed annually and then updated as needed. And finally, parents of these patients may also need FMLA documentation in order to allow them to be excused from work and to provide transportation and other means for support for patients to attend visits or come to the hospital when needed. I would like to call your attention to several important resources that can help with the interactions with the school. So the Lupus Foundation does have a very nice uh, school toolkit on their website. It has a lot of helpful information, including how to develop a specific plan and also how to prepare for college. Another important resource um, was uh, developed with some members of my team. And we worked with both the Lupus Initiative as well as the American College of Rheumatology to divide, um, or to develop rather, a guide for school nurses to help for caring uh, for children with lupus. So we've discussed some important principles of management, including um, mentioning the high prevalence of depression and some of the factors that contribute to its occurrence. We've also discussed some of the resources that are important to help children with lupus succeed in school. So another important question is how do these patients do um, when they become adults? Certainly lupus is a chronic disease and as a pediatric rheumatologist I strive to help ensure that they remain well throughout their disease course but that they are also successful in getting to adult care. So this study looked at a large group of adults who had been diagnosed with lupus during childhood. The study explored the course of their disease, the damage they experienced, as well as their health-related quality of life. And the patients in this group had had uh, lupus for approximately 20 years at the time of the assessment. So unfortunately, approximately half of the patients in this study were still taking steroids, meaning that they had not yet achieved a steroid-free remission. And I also take this to mean they likely had ongoing disease activity that prohibited them from being able to taper off of steroids. When asked about the impact of their medications, the majority reported a negative impact of therapy on their physical appearance, specifically weight gain associated with steroids. And then almost half of the patients had been hospitalized um, to receive IV antibiotics uh, to treat infections. 
after 10 to 20 years of disease duration, more than half of the subjects who were young in their 20s and 30s had already experienced significant damage. The most common areas of damage included musculoskeletal damage with both deforming arthritis or damage to their bone, uh, which is known as AVN. Some patients had cognitive impairment and other patients had gone on to develop end-stage renal disease, which would require dialysis. In addition, these patients also had lower health-related quality of life. The study looked at factors that were associated with disease damage, and this included, not surprisingly, long disease duration, um, high blood pressure, and also the presence of antiphospholipid antibodies, which are some of the autoantibodies seen in lupus that are associated with risk of developing blood clots. The patients who were currently using Plaquenil at the time of the study had protection against damage. And in our practice, we encourage patients to remain on Plaquenil really throughout their life, even if other medications are discontinued, because we believe that it helps to protect them from future disease flares, but also helps to protect from damage. Our team has also done some studies to specifically evaluate how our patients do after they transfer from pediatric care to adult care. So this study examined 190 patients who had been seen in our practice who went on to um, adult care. And unfortunately, there was a proportion of patients who did not do well. 11% of these subjects ultimately developed end-stage renal disease. And unfortunately, they were young, you know, in their early 20s when this happened. And then 5% of the patients actually died. And there were specific risk factors for this patient population that predicted the likelihood of poor outcomes. Um, having uh, public health insurance uh, was one risk factor. And then uh, any history of suspected uh, child abuse was also associated with these poor outcomes. This figure shows that minority patients from this population, as seen here in graph A, and then again, those with public insurance, as shown in graph B, uh, were the ones more likely to experience both end-stage renal disease or death. And so for me, these findings really underscore the fact that the population that my team cares for here in North Texas is especially vulnerable for poor outcomes. And so intentional vigilance is really warranted to try to help decrease their risk of these poor outcomes when they leave pediatric care. Our team performed another study um, to try to better understand the psychosocial factors that are associated with the transition process. And in this study, um, in-depth interviews were conducted with both pediatric and adult rheumatologists, nurses, a nurse practitioner, social worker, and psychologist. And the key themes um, from these interviews are listed here. I call your attention to the fact that uh, mental health and emotional support were noted to be important factors. Um, we've already discussed the role of family support as well as connection with peers. But finally, I think a very important theme that emerged from these interviews was the need for patients to develop resilience and ability to cope. And I think while these um, principles are very important um, in terms of the psychosocial aspects of transition, I think these principles are also very broad and have important application for all of the care that we provide, not just during the transfer process. So I've been fortunate to have the opportunity to come and speak um, at LFA events in the past. And so I've previously shared that my absolute favorite experience um, as a clinician is serving as a medical director for Camp Lupapalooza. So Camp Lupapalooza is a weekend therapeutic recreation camp that's sponsored through Children's Health, and it is designed for children and adolescents with lupus and lupus-related conditions. Um, we celebrated our 10th anniversary in 2019, and unfortunately have not held camp in the past two years uh, due to the pandemic. We go away to a campsite um, for the weekend and participate in a variety of fun activities, um, such as what is shown here um, with this one patient swinging from a very tall telephone pole. And during camp, um, campers have the opportunity to meet other patients who have a similar experience. And while the most important goal of camp is to really have fun and be challenged to try new things, patients are also developing key life skills in the process. 
Uh, we make a point to intentionally spend time educating patients about lupus, about their medications, and about important skills that they need to be successful in not only managing their disease, but also to be successful in life. And our team recently completed a project to evaluate the benefits of CAMP. Um, a focus group study uh, was performed where both current and former campers and their parents were interviewed. Participants discussed their overall patient experience at CAMP, the psychosocial impact of CAMP participation, the coping skills that they gained from the experience, as well as opportunities to prepare for transition. And the following slides provide some illustrative quotes from the study participants. So in terms of providing social support, one camper remarked, they all understand and can sit around and talk to each other about their insecurities and how they feel, and no one judges them. Finally, I have an outlet where I can talk to someone that knows exactly how I feel, and I don't have to constantly explain. Another camper remarked, personally, it did help me having other people with the same illness, being able to compare the things we went through and just not feeling alone with the illness because it feels like really alone. So it was nice to have other people I could talk to and even exchanging numbers and stuff with some of them so I can keep in touch. In terms of patient coping, another camper remarked, when you go to lupus camp, you will come back home grateful for the advice on how to live with lupus and what worked best for them. It really does help you. It helps you with your confidence about lupus. It teaches you more than just, oh, I have lupus. And finally, as it relates to improving transition readiness, another camper remarked, with me getting ready to leave pediatric care, they were giving us advice on how to be prepared, including advice about medicine and insurance and what we can do to stop flare-ups. I talked to counselors and nurses and doctors while at camp about what to expect, and it was helpful. For me, all of these quotes really illustrate the many benefits of camp uh, participation. And we're grateful that we have the opportunity uh, to bring um, such a wonderful group along. Uh, so today we've discussed um, how attention to psychosocial issues and the need to develop grit and resilience is critically important to help our patients do well. And I believe that Lupus Camp is an outstanding example of a fun but important strategy to accomplish this goal. So in conclusion, um, today we've discussed how lupus is severe in adolescent and children. They frequently have major organ disease, especially lupus nephritis, and are at high risk of developing damage as a consequence of both longstanding disease and its treatment. We've also discussed how comprehensive care for these patients really requires attention to all aspects of the patient and not just the clinical manifestations. We've discussed how pediatric lupus is a vulnerable population who has a great risk of poor outcomes, especially during the period in which they transfer to adult care. And we've also discussed how it is essential to pay attention to psychosocial issues and use creative strategies such as CAMP to help address them. It is an honor um, for us to be a part of our patient's journey. Um, they are beautiful, they're strong and they are resilient. Um, so I thank you so much again for the invitation to come and speak with you today and thank you for your attention.